I'm Bill Fulton. I am the director of the Kinder Institute here at Rice University and welcome to the Kinder Institute Forum with Fred Weary from the Dignity and Debt Network and, the, uh, and, and Princeton University. Um, the Kinder Institute Forum is our premier lecture series uh, bringing Houston thought leader, bringing urban thought leaders from all across the country to Houston, and we have Fred here today. Um, we'd like you to tweet this out today if you can, and please use uh, hashtag KI Forum, uh, hashtag KI Forum. Uh, please feel free to follow us on Twitter at, at Rice Kinder INST, at Rice Kinder INST. We should have plenty of time for QA. Uh, I'll moderate the QA uh, as is typical of a, of a, um, of a Zoom uh, webinar, uh, put the questions in the Q&A box. At the bottom, of course, there's a chat box and a Q&A box. If you can put the questions in the Q&A box. Also, uh, we'll try to answer the questions in the most, pop the most popular questions first. So if you see a question you like, click like, that'll move it up the list and we'll get to that question first. Um, I wanna thank PNC Bank uh, and Julie, if you could come on now. Uh, I want to thank PNC Bank. The 2021 Kinder Institute Forum Series is made possible thanks to our friends at PNC Bank, the title sponsor of the lecture series. And this is a, we've been, I'd like to introduce Julie Sadath, the regional president for PNC in Houston. And as you were saying, as we were saying before this started, Julie, this is just a great, uh, a great uh, a, a, a convergence of, of sponsor and topic, I think. So, Julie, thank you for PNC's support and welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as Bill said, I'm Julie young Sadath, the regional president for PNC Bank here in Houston, and we're so excited to be with you as the title sponsor of the Kinder Institute Forum Series. We feel quite fortunate to have partnered with the Kinder Institute since we established PNC's presence in Houston uh, right at three years ago. And now as our, our presence is expanding significantly in Houston, across Texas, and across the country, we're honored to support the Institute's critical work, which has far-reaching implications. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to today's discussion with Dr. Weary about how credit visibility, credit scoring, and consumer credit markets serve as arenas for struggle over dignity and belonging for many people. Um, this is a critical discussion and one that seems to be getting more attention these days, and rightfully so. Uh, PNC's purpose as a Main Street bank is to make a positive impact and positive difference in communities uh, we're serving by leveraging the power of our resources to help everyone move forward financially. Most recently, this was demonstrated by the introduction of a program called Low Cash Mode, which is a new digital capability that we created to provide flexibility to customers and to empower them to avoid overdraft fees. Across PNC, we're very excited about this solution uh, because we believe it's a game changer for the banking industry by putting financial control into the hands of our customers. With the implementation of low cash mode, PNC expects to help our customers save and avoid $150 million of overdraft fees annually. Uh, this is just one example of how we develop innovative <clears throat> solutions to further enhance financial well being of all the people that we serve. It was um, recently announced that PNC is the first bank to offer two products that meet the Cities for Financial Empowerment Funds Bank on National Certification. Both our foundation checking and PNC Smart Access prepaid visa accounts meet this standards, <clears throat> which are developed to ensure um, expanded access to safe and appropriate financial products and services to the almost 36 million people in the United States who are outside of the Main Street financial system. Bank ON's 2021 through 2022 standards require low cost, no out overdraft, and full functioning features. And we strongly believe the Houston region and customers across our entire footprint will benefit from these tools that are gonna help individuals remain in and have access to the banking system. This, this afternoon, we're so eager to hear the insights from Dr. Weary um, on this critical issue of making banking and financial services more accessible to everyone. So with that, I'm happy to turn it back to you, Bill, and thank you again for having me today. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to PNC for making this, not just today's program, but this entire series possible. Um, generous support for this uh, 
for the Kinder Institute also comes through a multi-year grant from Houston Endowment. Uh, we rely on philanthropic investments from many other contributors. Special thanks go to Nancy and Rich Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, the Baxter Trust, Chevron, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, Wells Fargo, the Cullen Foundation, Raynat and Stan Merrick, uh, PNC Bank, as we said, Claire and Eric, Anya, Catherine and Hank Coleman, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, Bank of America, Bracewell, HEB, and United Way of Greater Houston. Um, so I'm going to introduce Fred uh, Weary now, and uh, Fred Weary now, and Fred, if you could turn on your video and your microphone. Uh, Frederick Weary is a Townsend Martin class of 1917 professor of sociology at Princeton. He is director of the Dignity and Debt Network, a partnership between the Social Science Research Council and Princeton. And I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our wonderful friends here at January Advisors in Houston have been helping you with some of these projects. Um, Fred is the co-author of the book, Credit Where It's Due, Rethinking Financial Citizenship, and editor of the Oxford Handbook of Consumption, the four volume Sage Encyclopedia of Economics and Society. And that book right behind him that you can see, Money Talks, How Money Really Works. So Fred, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. And again, uh, for, our, uh, for our people listening and watching, if you have any questions, just put them in the Q&A box and we will work through those after Fred finishes his presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, Fred Weary. Thanks so much, Bill, for um, having me and uh, great to uh, hear what PNC is doing. Um, and, and I just wish we could have done this in person, but uh, who knows what the future holds. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes. Um, I, I hope that it feels as if uh, it's shorter because uh, it, it's the work of many hands as you will soon uh, see. Uh, so, um, as Bill mentioned, uh, much of the work that I'm doing these days uh, is really through partnerships. Um, it's, it's already hard enough uh, to ask the kinds of questions that we're asking about um, uh, economic justice uh, in normal times. Um, and, and the challenges that we face today requires the work of many hands. And so uh, you'll later see a, a, a work that we're doing with January Advisors um, and HyperObject um, on, on debt collection, but I'm going to start by just talking about credit, um, credit it and, this, and how people uh, gain a sense of belonging through credit. Uh, I'm going to then move to debt, student debt in particular, uh, and then finish off with debt collection. Now, I, I, I want to give you a sense of why I do some of what I do. Um, and so one of the things I've been long drawn to um, are the things that are not seen. Um, and it's easy to assume that if we can't see something, maybe it doesn't exist or it doesn't matter. But too often, what we don't see has such a force in our lives that we know it's there, even though we can't see it. Um, so I can't see the wind, uh, but I can see what winds can do, how they rustle leaves or take down houses. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about winds that are picking up speed, that have already caused some damage, uh, and that will cause much more. And these are the winds that are blowing through our finances. And so uh, one of the things that, that's, uh, that's difficult to see are credit scores. Uh, everyone has their own individual credit score. And so unlike things like race uh, or gender, uh, credit scores aren't obvious. It's not sketched onto our, 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 our bodies. Uh, and the scores are changing over time. Uh, and so we can see when a neighborhood seems to have a, a large percentage of a particular racial or ethnic group. What we can't see very easily is whether a neighborhood um, has a particular distribution of credit scores or credit invisibility uh, and how that affects uh, the lives of the people living in those uh, places. Uh, the other thing that makes it more difficult is that, you know, these are scores that are created um, by companies with proprietary um, algorithms. And so credit really matters um, and yet we can't see it. Now, the way that uh, we start to see it is in the moments in which we're trying to do things that are really important in our lives. And so um, it's a work I was doing with an award-winning uh, nonprofit called the Mission Asset Fund. 
uh, we interviewed about 57 of their clients back in um, 2015. And we heard a number of stories about uh, how their credit invisibility was getting in the way of them doing really basic things. Um, so there was one uh, woman we met, uh, she was trying to leave an abusive relationship uh, with her daughter and she wanted to move into a safe uh, neighborhood. Now, when she showed up to rent this apartment, um, uh, they said, you know, we're gonna need to do uh, a credit check and you're gonna need to leave a security deposit. And what she told them is she said, well, you know, I don't really have a credit score, but I have a lot of money in savings. Um, you can see that I have a regular job. I'm willing to show you sort of my bank statements, et cetera. And they said, no, you know, if you, um, some of them said no outright uh, and others said, uh, you know, you're gonna have to pay more in, in, in a security deposit in order to rent here. And so in the most desirable neighborhoods, she either had blocked access or she was going to pay much more for access by virtue of uh, her credit invisibility. There was a, another woman we met who was really proud of the work that she was doing at a franchise. Um, she was basically the assistant manager getting really good performance reviews every year um, could do every single job um, at that place of work. Uh, and when a job was coming open, uh, the job of uh, the manager was coming open, uh, she thought she had a shot at it. The outgoing manager told her, you know, you told me that about six months ago or so, um, you uh, broke up with your, with your spouse, uh, that your credit was now ruined. And you know they're going to do a credit check. And the way they uh, do these credit checks, they're going to say, if you can't take care of your own money, how will you take care of ours? Uh, and so you won't have a shot at it. And, and she was really disappointed and just kind of gave up. And so there was a sense that even though she could do the job, um, she would not have an opportunity to show that she could do the job by virtue of her credit score. Now, this is not to say that credit scores are bad things, uh, because on the one hand, we would like people to extend us credit based on what we do rather than who we are. Um, and so there are components of the credit score um, that are pretty sensible uh, in terms of how many credit accounts you have open, how long you've had those accounts, um, how much credit you have left and getting a sense of how often you pay on time. And so it's really there just to tell people um, by way of a score, whether or not you're likely to pay what you owe and whether or not you're, you're likely to pay it on time. And so in general, we think if you have something that's pretty objective and if everybody's being treated the same way, isn't that a good thing? The, one of the difficulties, of course, is that when you have 45 million uh, adults in the US um, who uh, either, um, are credit invisible, they don't show up at all uh, in the credit system, or they have so few lines of credit that there is a, it's impossible to score them, then you're really looking at people who have no identification. It's as if they don't exist. They have no rights to full participation in the marketplace, um, even though some of them are viable and able. And this leads us to sort of these new maps of inequality. Um, and so there was some work done in 2018 at the Boston Federal Reserve in which they just wanted to get a sense of um, across our neighborhoods in Boston, uh, what, are, what, what are the average credit scores? Um, and are we seeing a concentration of disadvantage uh, in space? Um, and is this concentration uh, of disadvantage uh, sort of layering on to other forms of disadvantage. Now, when you're seeing a concentration of disadvantage in space, and but that concentration of disadvantage seems to be based on something that's objective, uh, you, it, it makes it very difficult for the people living in those places to do anything about their situations. And so, um, as we found out through experimental evidence, uh, some work by some colleagues, uh, people with the same credit score weren't being treated in the same way. Um, and so uh, there was a sense that it, it's unfair if we have the same score, but somehow your score is not like mine. And the way that this was happening um, is uh, on the one hand, um, 
employers were now increasingly requiring credit checks um, uh, when they were evaluating um, candidates. And so uh, Rourke O'Brien, um, who's at Yale, and Barbara Kiviat, who just joined at Stanford, uh, just ran an experiment with about a thousand hiring managers. And what they did was they wanted to get a sense of, um, you know, by race and by gender, uh, is having a bad credit score, even when you hold everything else constant, is that going to block someone from getting called in for an interview? And if they are getting called in for an interview, is it going to affect what the recommended starting salary is for those folks? So they ran the experiment. Um, and what they did was they on the they used names, uh, sort of, this is the, I love the names. Uh, uh, they looked at the, sense, the, the, the census um, to see uh, what were the most popular names among African-American males and females, most popular names among uh, Black American males and females. And they came up uh, with the, on the male part of it uh, with Greg Baker and Tyrone Washington. Those were the only indicators of race. And now the, the good thing about uh, uh, the, the, the male story um, is that both men were equally likely to be called in for a job, you know, with the same work experience and education. But when it was time to sort of ask the hiring managers about um, uh, recommended starting salaries, uh, if you had a bad, uh, credit uh, score and you're a black and male, you were uh, likely to be uh, recommended a lower starting salary than your white counterparts with the same characteristics. Um, now the, the story for women is, is a little worse. Um, if you're a woman versus a man with a bad credit score, you're just more, less likely to be called in uh, uh, for the job interview. Now, on the one hand, we could sort of think that we're just looking at a problem of math and getting the algorithm right. Um, and we're maybe thinking about sort of the solitary economic actor with the uh, calculator trying to sort of get the math right. Um, and, but what instead, what I found when talking uh, with people who were suffering under these conditions, it was more than math. It was also a question of social membership. And one of the most distressing things that I heard, it wasn't the most distressing, um, but as an, as an educator and someone who thinks that history matters, um, there was one woman we encountered who said, uh, she just questioned why our histories uh, matter uh, for anything anymore, because it's really about finance and not, and not history. Um, she said, it, why is it that I was taught about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and all this irrelevant stuff? Um, you know, it's, great if you're a history buff, but that doesn't help me now. Uh, and the reason it doesn't help me now is that for me to be an autonomous adult who's making decisions, um, I have to be able to get a car loan or a mortgage. If I can't get those things, then I am not an adult. Um, Meanwhile, young people were seeing credit cards as a way of uh, entering into adulthood. Um, and the first, and this one person noted, the first time I got my credit card, I was like, swipe, swipe. I didn't think about the repercussions because I was so excited about the credit card. Um, and, and what they were also uh, noting is that everything that they needed to do as an adult, um, you know, checking into a hotel, um, renting a car, they felt as if they didn't have that credit card, they couldn't do all these adult things. Uh, now, one of my sociology colleagues, Rachel Dwyer, uh, who's at Ohio State University, and her colleagues, um, they looked at the National Longitudinal Study of Youth, um, and they wanted to get a sense of um, how does credit card debt or education debt, what does that do to a person's sense of mastery or self-esteem? Um, and how does that vary by socioeconomic status? And one of the findings uh, here is for people who were in the lower socioeconomic um, class, uh, having some education debt seemed to be really positive for their sense of self-esteem, at least early on. And, and so one of the ways that I think about this is these were people who were using education as a way of climbing up the ladder. Um, it was their, um, their uh, way, uh, road to um, economic and social mobility. And so here they were showing that they were taking charge of their life through their education debt. Now, for the middle class, um, it's that uh, 
having credit card debt that allows you to do all the things, access, access all the things that your friends are accessing to live a middle class life. Um, but thankfully for the upper classes, um, uh, their self esteem is completely protected from things like credit card debt and education debt. It has no effect on their sense of mastery and self esteem. Now, one of the things to note here is that while total education debt seems to be positive uh, for people with lower economic status, um, that, that positive um, sort of goes in the opposite direction the longer that debt is carried. And so, um, so here we're getting a sense that when people are dealing with credit and debt, it has a lot more to do with um, having visibility has a lot more to do with being able to live where you want to live, to be able to work without needing a special permit. Um, and some of the people that we spoke to thought that it should have had a lot more to do with protection, um, the right to defense um, from outside aggressors. Uh, and, and as the people talk about the, the, the right to protection, it started sounding much more like uh, the rights of citizenship. And so we think that doesn't matter where you live, um, it doesn't matter if you are in a sparsely populated place like Alaska or a very small place like Hawaii, um, if you're attacked um, by some kind of outside aggressor or even an internal aggressor, you think that the state should somehow st step in to protect you. You also uh, think that you uh, have a right to help and to participate in the collective defense. And so as people talked about um, their experiences with credit and with debt, they were really talking about um, a, sen a sense of, um, of, of social membership, of citizenship. Now, having a sense of membership and belonging too often comes at a very high cost. And I remember growing up in South Carolina and, 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 and I call them the old folks because that's what they were always referred to. The old folks said, um, and, and they would say to us, you know, your education is the one thing they can't take away from you. So you have to do whatever it takes to get your education. Um, and, and one of the things that they meant by that was that uh, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of what we strive for, um, you know, you, can, you, you might win or lose in the marketplace, uh, but the gains to human capital um, are both a sort of gains that help you um, move ahead in the world, but they're also gains that tell us um, uh, that we are sort of worthy um, we, to, to sort of be treated like everyone else. Now, people paid dearly for this right to education. Um, and so, uh, when we're looking at a study by uh, Addo, Hool, and Simon back in 2016, um, they found that uh, Black student loan debt uh, uh, among this cohort of 25-year-olds was uh, roughly $43,000, a little more, and it was almost doubled the amount from what uh, white student loan debt was. And over time, the gaps got even bigger. And so we convened um, a group uh, at Princeton uh, through the Dignity and Debt Network um, a, in collaboration with the Aspen Institute's um, financial security program. And when we did that, um, one of the things that, that, that we really kind of honed in on uh, was just how uh, the student debt crisis and some of the other debt crises um, had kind of a racial component to them. And so if you're looking at 12 years after college, uh, and if you're black, you owe more than, 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 than you did when you left college. Um, if you're Latinx, you owe 79% of what you owed, uh, of, of what you borrowed. And if you're white, you've cut it down about half. Um, and this is becoming um, especially concerning uh, because uh, once you find yourself uh, overly indebted, uh, you also find yourself having um, interactions um, that are uh, that are pretty nasty. Uh, and so uh, we were digging through the, the consumer complaints uh, database uh, at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And, and some of the things that we found, um, so for example, here, uh, this is a, a woman who had gone back to school. Uh, she was no longer 
paying uh, her student debts uh, on time. Uh, in fact, she had stopped paying for quite some time. She received a phone call while she was in the car uh, driving and she had her phone on, um, on speaker and her daughter was sitting there and she was told um, uh, that, you know, they were gonna send um, a sheriff to padlock the front door and that she was gonna be arrested. And this man became belligerent, started using curse words. And he said, you know, that's why you're in collections because you're a loser. And upon hearing this, her daughter started to cry. And she asked, why was this mean man calling you a loser, mommy? And so you can imagine someone who has um, taken on student debt as a way of elevating herself and her family uh, and found that instead it has routed her um, into a situation in which she no longer has a right to respect. And as we looked through, we, we downloaded over 4,000 um, uh, narrative complaints uh, on student debt from the CFPB. And we just read them through and we found um, that people were talking about this pursuit of opportunity that was supposed to be really positive, turning into a government guaranteed trap. They re referred to their student loans as financial slavery, as a prison. Um, they complained that when they would call the student loan servicer, they were being given false information um, and they were being told they could do the income uh, based repayments. Um, but uh, somehow the income based repayments never materialized. Um, and in fact, when we look at the number of students who have had their debts canceled by virtue of their incomes, I think it's close to 35 um, over the course of the entire program. And when we look at students who are supposed to get their debts forgiven for doing, sort of doing public service after 10 years, uh, I think they've had about a 95 to 97% rejection rate of those applications because they were told that they didn't sign up right. Um, and so there are, there are these people who are sort of um, deciding they're going to become social workers or other uh, types of jobs that are uh, that are not as remunerative, uh, but they said, you know, after 10 years, I'll be forgiven, so I'll just pay the minimum. And instead, they find that um, that uh, the servicers uh, did not do their jobs, um, and and they're on the hook for it as the as the borrower. The other thing that's been happening lately um, is a lot of uh, debates have been uh, going forth about um, student debt cancellation. Um, and so I've been working with uh, Charlie Eaton and Laura Hamilton at uh, University of California Merced and with Adam Goldstein here at, at Princeton just to figure out, you know, what, what did the numbers really tell us? Um, and there was a large misunderstanding out there that, that um, if you do uh, debt cancellation, you're basically helping people who don't need it. And so we just wanted to sort of look at the same data that um, other people were looking at um, a, and, and asking ourselves, how did they come to the conclusions they did? Um, and so a lot of that has to do with what you put in the numerator or the denominator, and especially the denominator. Um, and a lot of that also has to do with whether or not you're just looking at income or if you're also taking it into account wealth. And the reason that we thought it's so important to think about wealth, um, it, which are the household assets, um, is because we know that there is a, sort of a 10 to one difference uh, in wealth by race. And so at the higher levels of income, income's great, high income is great, as, as, as you know, no one's gonna tell you otherwise. Uh, but at that higher income level, you have more black households that have really low wealth at higher income levels. And so sometimes it'll look as if uh, you're helping people who have higher incomes, and then you look and say, oh, but actually they have very low wealth. Um, and when we look at wealth, we see a really progressive distribution um, if you decide you're going to do something like a $50,000 cancellation um, as proposed by... Um, uh, Warren uh, and Schumer. And so this is a report that just came out at the, that we just put out with the Roosevelt Institute. The other thing too um, is um, we see that white households in the top 10%, if you look at that figure seven to the far right, to my far right, um, would receive an average of $648 in debt cancellation per person. Um, and by contrast, if you're in the bottom 20% and you're white, you're receiving an average of 
59% in debt canceled, $59 in debt cancellation, which is, you know, four times as much debt is canceled in that lower um, uh, asset group than in the uh, upper asset group and the, and the problem holds. Um, now, the final thing I want to note about sort of these figures that are in the paper, and you should take your time to get a good read, um, is that we used uh, the, the color scheme and some of the designs that were developed, uh, visualization techniques developed by W.E.B. Du Bois back in 1900. And so he developed the spiral graph, as you see, in order to solve a problem that we're still grappling with. And what is that problem? So after emancipation, um, black household wealth was low to non-existent. And to depict black and white wealth differences side by side would require running the bars off the page or making the conditions of black folks visually disappear on the scale. The benefits of cancellation of black households in the bottom deciles of net worth cannot be overstated compared with the little that spills into the top. And that, this is why we, we rely on, uh, on Du Bois. The other thing that we, we started seeing as we were looking through the uh, data from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, was this practice of uh, skip tracing. And so, you know, if you're not paying uh, your debts and you've got a debt collector on your trail, um, they're going to trace through your social and professional network um, to try to figure out where you are. And they're supposed to do this without giving information um, away about your financial uh, situation. Um, now, what happens when, uh, when you're dealing with skip tracing? Well, uh, in the late 70s, it was uh, really a problem. Um, and so uh, what we see in the late 70s is um, a, a testimony by the Honorable Millicent Fenwick on a at the 77th congressional hearing. And, uh, and, fin and he noted the debt collector, uh, when he got nowhere uh, after pursuing this woman and, and, and threatening to go to her, um, he then threatened to go to her husband's employer. And she said, you know, you can uh, talk to my husband's employer if you like, uh, but he self he's a self-employed lawyer, so he employs himself. And the collector responded by contacting the attorney's best clients um, uh, who asked the, the embarrassed husband about his wife's uh, debt. And so what we started seeing is that um, debt collectors were using skip tracing as a way to um, both apply pressure, but they were applying pressure by damaging valuable social relationships. Um, and these relational damages are especially important for people who have to rely on them for all sorts of other supports. One student uh, debtor noted, um, student loan uh, uh, debtor noted that his uncle was no longer speaking to him because he hates the situation I've put him in. My uncle's retired, trying to live out his life as much as possible. And I know that this is all my fault. Um, I work full time already. I'm married. I have a house, a child. I have to pay childcare, and my uncle is has has been helping in all sorts of ways. And now he says that he's not going to help me anymore, and I it's just not fair and it's unjust. On another um, uh, narrative complaint, um, this person noted that not only um, was performance recovery calling my work phone. And I told them, don't call this work phone again. But they were also calling my mom's work phone um, and harassing her. And so there's a way that you're, you're seeing this, um, uh, this tension sort of developing within families over having um, these potentially uh, damaging phone calls uh, being placed at their, at, at their, at their work. Um, one boss has had several talks uh, so my boss is at several talks with me because they asked that I have the debt collector stop calling my place of employment and they wouldn't. Um, and this other person noted, you know, and when they call, they say things like, we know she's there, put her on the phone. Uh, and so here, um, there's a real sense that um, not only are, is their reputation being damaged, but perhaps, um, you know, their future at this place of employment, um, their capacity to be promoted it may also be impaired. Uh, I think the most egregious thing was uh, hearing about 
um, the boss's personal cell phone number somehow um, being called and 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 the and the boss being harassed even though he is not a co-signer. And so what we're start to see um, is that you have these um, <clears throat> contractual relationships. Yes, people who have agreed to be co-signers who are family members, um, but you are also seeing family members and friends who didn't agree to be co-signers who are not a party to the contract. You're seeing bosses and co-workers and other professional relationships that are being damaged in the, in the course of trying to collect these debts. As uh, one person noted, you know, it's one thing to sort of call me and tell me that I need to pay because I know I need to pay um, and I want to pay and I, I, and I want to work something out because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a thief. It's another thing to be treated as if you never really meant to pay um, and, that, and that you've always had sort of really bad intentions. And a lot of what the debtors were talking about was this uh, deficit of dignity. They were being treated as, they, as if they were unworthy of respect. And um, they were also being treated in a way that didn't recognize some uh, limitation about, um, about their lives or about, and their current conditions. And so um, if you ever pick up um, uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya's uh, The Honor Code, you'll see a discussion about recognition and respect and sort of treating people in ways that give some kind of appropriate weight about some fact about them. Um, and so, you know, if they're a sensitive person, you might speak to them more gently. Um, if you see that they, um, they have a cane, you might um, see if they need some kind of assistance or, or accommodation. Um, the, the way I think about this is um, growing up um, it, right before Sunday school would start, there was Mr. Frank and Mr. Frank could not hear very well. And, the, and we would, they, my auntie would say, say good morning to, to Mr. Frank. And we'd say good morning, Mr. Frank. And we'd have to do it about three times at very loud volume uh, before he would say that he could hear us. Um, and, I, and he got, he got a real thrill out of it. Um, but, but this was a, one of those moments as a child where we were being taught you know, if someone can't really hear that well, then it's up to us to try to respect that part of them and to do something that sort of allows them to be able to participate um, in what other, what, whatever gathering we're in. Um, and when you're a debtor, uh, this extension of dignity, um, uh, this recognition respect is not something that you enjoy. Now, unfortunately, and, and, and I'm all for sort of um, gov appropriate government interventions, um, uh, but the government has done some things that have made uh, the situation worse. And so uh, if your life is anything like Yolanda Fountain Henderson, you know uh, what the government's done. Um, so she was profiled in a ProPublica a uh, piece by Paul Keel and Annie Walden back in 2015. And Ms. Henderson is the mayor of a small town just outside of St. Louis. And as she looked down her block at the 16 houses arrayed on either side of the street, she knew that half of those houses had someone in them who had been sued by a debt collector uh, and summoned to court. She only knew this because she was sitting in front of a computer screen um, and talking with the journalists who were showing her the list of names and addresses for debt cases. Now, Mayor Henderson knew these names very well. Um, uh, many of the names she knew especially well, including her own. Uh, she recalled how the sewer company sued her and she described the moment she discovered that all the money in her credit union account had been seized. It amounted to, the, to $382, not enough to pay what she still owed them. While she could say without hyperbole, they are suing all of us, there was no way for most people being sued to know whether they were in a neighborhood like this one bearing the brunt. In 2013, an estimated 4 million workers had their wages garnished for consumer debts, but who are these debtors? Is there a difference in where they live and how much they make? Does race matter? Um, these are things that we would think would just be basic um, sort of data points uh, easily accessible. Uh, but they are not. The other thing I think that I found uh, really surprising um, was that during the financial crisis, uh, not the financial crisis, but the pandemic, um, 
and we go from one crisis to the next, but the pandemic was pretty a pretty significant one, and it continues. But in August of last year, um, they were debt collectors were still filing thousands of suits uh, all in Indiana and Atlanta, um, uh, over two thousand seven hundred suits in Maryland in August, and yet no national numbers on these suits exist. Um, is there is no information? Um, we can't easily map it. So what we do know is that if you are sort of low household income, you are about five times uh, more likely to be sued than someone, uh, more 10 times more likely to be sued um, than someone of higher income, uh, sort of making over $70,000. We also know um, that for the most part, when defendants uh, appear in court, um, uh, or when the cases are taken to court, uh, for the most part, 70% of the time, the judgment is for the plaintiff. It's a default judgment. Most of the time, the, the defendants don't, don't, don't even show up. And in a very few cases, less than 10%, uh, we see defendants with legal counsel in court according to Pew, with, and, and they're, they're using the best numbers available um, on that. And, and, and one of the other things that they note is that um, some of the cases are seem, seem to be pretty rough. Um, and so in 2014, a court in Washington state determined that a person who owed $9,861 in medical debt, but had paid most of it off, 8,500, they still owed an additional 8,500. And so here we're seeing um, people getting spiraled down um, into debts that are impossible to pay. So what can we do about it? One of the things that we've, we're, we've decided to do um, is to launch a debt collection lab. Um, and thankfully we had um, some strong support from our friends over at the eviction lab. Um, and we were able to link up with uh, January Advisors uh, Data Science uh, Consulting um, and HyperObject who does, a, and they do a lot of work with um, data visualization. Uh, and, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, you know, if you have over 70 million adults in the US who have had a debt turned over to a private debt collector, which is roughly one in three adults, that's that could be anybody. Um, uh, we know too little about this. Um, and so what can we do uh, to sort of better understand what's going on? And so we talked we talk to January advisors about um, scraping online court data to see who was being taken to court and, and, and where it was happening. And we wanted to do it in real time. And we wanted to be able to say, you know what, uh, this is what it looks like during the pandemic. This is what it looked like uh, in the pre-pandemic years. This is what's happening month to month um, in order to sort of um, draw attention to any hot spots out there. Uh, and so the, our vision of data infrastructure and a data commons is if there's uh, data out there that might um, make a really positive difference in people's lives, um, then they should have access to it. Now, one of the things too, is we wanted to see, you know, is there uh, a, a a distribution of debt collection lawsuits across space? Does it have anything to do with race of, of the census tract? Does it have anything to do with the median income of the census tract? And so we're starting to map that now. Um, and as you can see here in St. Louis County, uh, uh, you can see where the hot spots, some of the hot spots are, um, it, especially uh, just north of Ferguson. The other thing you can see here is that while just under a quarter of the neighborhoods are majority black, they account for 41% of the lawsuits. Um, uh, and so compared to the, their share of the population. And so while this is not proof of discrimination, it is evidence that the experience of debt collection is different in black versus uh, white communities. Um, in some areas of the country. And it's gonna take us more work to discern other differences or similarities and to put in proper controls. Um, but this is work that, uh, that, we're, that we're now doing at the Debt Collection Lab. 
We've also started uh, working to um, ask ourselves, well, who are the plaintiffs? Um, and so as you can see here in Harris County, the top five uh, debt collectors that we are tracking um, who account for about 0.2% of all the debt collectors um, um, listed um, it, it, across the lawsuits account for about 44% of the lawsuits. Um, and so part of what we're, we're doing here is just sort of um, drawing attention to uh, the extent to which the industry is concentrated and what that means for that industry's power. And the final thing I'll say here is that, um, you know, there are some things that you just can't do um, all by yourself. Uh, and so to extract at this scale um, requires some government assistance. Um, and what we're finding is that some of the courts impede transparency with all sorts of data rules uh, that make it very hard to to sort of say, oh, this is what's happening. Um, this is this is the these are the kinds of disparate impacts that are happening, um, and this is because of rules that are being put in place in some places. As we move forward, um, one of the things that we uh, uh, will be doing is this summer pulling together a methodology report um, and also putting together our data sharing protocols because it's important for us that whatever we are able to collect, um, that it becomes uh, property of the public. Um, and so uh, if, the, if we're saying that we're doing this so that um, uh, people's lives can be better, then people who work with um, uh, consumers, consumer advocates, consumers themselves and others, they should be able to access this data. Um, journalists should be able to access this data, students should be able to access this data. There is no need uh, to hold on to data because you're waiting for sort of that, that the one paper to finally arrive in print in and, and, um, and a, and a one to two to three years. No, no, um, we will be doing data sharing more or less immediately as once we have the uh, data sharing agreements um, ironed out and, and we're ensuring um, uh, that privacy concerns are also still met. We'll also be diagnosing any data gaps and thinking through user experience. And so the different communities of people using these, uh, this resource, um, you know, users have, uh, once, once they're uh, moving around on a, with a tool, there may be things that uh, make it harder for them to access. And there may be things that, that, uh, that are especially important for them. And so we'll be paying attention to that as we make adjustments. And the final thing we'll be doing is integrating arts and, and diverse storytelling traditions. And so what you see here are some um, paintings that I, I commissioned from two students at Princeton. And, I, and basically the charge was, uh, let's look at the work that um, Jacob Lawrence did with the migration series, uh, and let's do a series um, on debt collection. We'll call it the Debt Collector Series. And so this is just a sample of some of the work they've done uh, um, but we're going to be recruiting other painters and poets and um, people working on um, documentaries and um, uh, sort of all sorts of storytelling traditions as we go forward. So because we need to turn this away from it being about data data and towards uh, it being about um, how people are experiencing that data. Uh, and so to conclude, I'll simply say that it's my belief that we really can't fix the things that, uh, that we can't easily see or upon seeing that we refuse to understand. And as an academic, I have no um, illusions. Uh, I know that I'm not a, a savior of any kind, uh, but I am here to bear witness to patterns, uh, meanings and their causes and to build infrastructures to facilitate witness. And so in partnership with January Advisors and HyperObject and the Social Science Research Council, we're working to show credit and debt in a meaningful way, not just to understand it, but to bend it towards justice. And with that, I will um, uh, open it up for discussion. Um, thank you, Fred. That was great, um, really interesting. Uh, we have a number of questions and for the audience, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the, um, uh, uh, in the Q and A box rather than the chat box, that way people can vote on them and the questions can go up. So please feel free to throw your questions in. I'm gonna start asking, the, I'll, I'll moderate and ask the questions, Fred. Um, okay. I, I wanted to start out by asking one 
you've done you've done something that many other social scientists are now doing, uh, such as Ross Shetty and so forth, which is really daylighting a whole bunch of uh, patterns, both uh, both uh, statistically and geographically, that no one has ever seen before on this topic, right? Um, and as you said, your goal is to highlight the experience of people. Uh, do how do you think that this data work you've done with January and others is going to be able to inform, say, public policy around this issue? Right? Is is that the goal? Uh, in addition to just highlighting it, and if so, are you getting a, are you getting traction on that? Uh, yes. So um, so we're in conversation with uh, National Consumer Law Center, uh, with uh, Pew's group on um, uh, that are working on uh, modernizing the courts um, and making um, the decisions of the court of course, more transparent and more equitable. Um, and so the, the way that we're thinking about this is on the one hand, um, there are all of these uh, abuses uh, that no one seems to be talking about um, and, that's, and it's been very, very difficult to sort of, um, uh, to, uh, to, to prosecute. Um, and so the first thing we wanted to do is just be able to say, look, this is how, this is where it's, um, this is how it's distributed in space. Um, and across populations, um, and this is what it feels like for the people who are who are who are having to deal with this. Um, and what we're finding is that the consumer advocates themselves are sort of telling us, um, "Look, this is really helpful for us because we're 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 trying to um, uh, push through some legislation uh, to kind of make debt collection um, more uh, transparent and fair." Um, and so even though there are a lot of things that are not legal, um, uh, like calling someone's workplace and saying, I know you're there and you owe money, uh, you actually can't do that legally. Um, it's most consumers don't think that there's any, any form of, of redress, like where, like where are they going to go? And, and most people just experience this in a, in a quiet way, in a quiet way. Uh, and so if you're, if you're getting harassed, the last thing you want to do is tell your uh, extended family members who don't might not already know that you're being harassed. You don't want to tell anybody because that's that's what shame does. And so what shame does is it tells you uh, try to hide the fact that you're being harassed. Um, a, you didn't pay what you owed. So it's probably your fault, um, even though some of them are like, I don't really owe what they say I owe. Uh, but you're trying to hide it. And so if you mm -hmm. have if, if you mm -hmm. have consumers who are hiding the, the fact that they're in trouble, then it, mm -hmm. you, you can't get any public consciousness around what's yeah. going on. And, the, and they themselves aren't trying to sort of go out and do anything about it because uh, they're in hiding. And so part of what this is meant to do is to sort of say, it's okay to come out of hiding. Um, and by wow. coming out of hiding, everyone's going to be better off. Wow. Okay. Let's go to some of the questions here. Um, one of which you all sort of answered, but I'm going to go in the uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go on the Q and A in, in the order that that they of popularity. At least for now, there's a couple others I'll skip to. Um, Cassie Jones asks, and this is kind of long, but I'll read it all. Can you further address how the roles we play in society impact and highlight our implicit biases versus important decisions that are made, especially with regards to access to credit? How do we combat these biases when some people do not even acknowledge they exist or that the implicit biases are affecting their decisions? I think that you were suggesting in the, in the comparison between Greg Baker and Tyrone Washington that there might be an implicit bias here. Yes. Uh, so, um, so one of the things that, that I was suggesting um, is that we take um, we take the tools that we have available to us, and we do the best we can with those tools, right? Um, and so, one of the challenges here is that when people are making those kinds of mistakes, um, there are a lot of people who are sort of making honest mistakes. Uh, they see themselves as being uh, fair-minded people. And, and, and if they were in a sort of interpersonal, it's a friend of yours, uh, they would do whatever they could for you. Um, but in that work environment, and you're making, when you're making those uh, quick decisions and you see a name roll across the desk, sometimes the type of name you see somehow um, sends your evaluative prism into a different shape. And so you, you, so you evaluate the information you have in front of you in a slightly different way. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind with, uh, uh, with these kinds of biases uh, is that sometimes if you ask the person, um, so, so Diva Pager and her colleagues, they did this experiment where they sent um, 
testers out uh, with resumes um, and they asked the testers, you know, uh, did you feel as if you were being unfairly treated um, when you went uh, for that interview? And the, most of the time the testers said no. Now, when they instead looked at the pattern of uh, what happened when they first sent the black guy versus the a Latino guy versus the white guy in, one of the things they saw was they all, in some cases, they all had a positive response, um, but sometimes the white person got um, a, sort of tracked upward. And so they were applying for a standard job and they said, well, you know, we have this other job, uh, it's higher pay um, and you're, you, you're probably a quick study. And so we're gonna route you there. Whereas other people might've been sort of tracked downwards into jobs that were slightly lower pay, mm -hmm in the back, you know, not as much sort of uh, visibility, et cetera. Um, but they were, it was done in a really nice way. Uh, and so the testers themselves did, didn't, didn't perceive it. And probably mm -hmm. the people making those decisions um, didn't perceive it. And so what do you do? How, so how, how do you sort of um, make these things uh, more apparent so that people can act on them? Um, the only way you can, people can act on it is if they can see it. And if they feel as if they're, they're being presented the information in a way that doesn't say, you set out to do this, um, but instead says, uh, guess what? You are, um, you are a social animal. Um, you are subject to social forces that you, that you don't actually see. Um, there are patterns out there that, um, and one mm -hmm. of the things that we can do is we can help you, we can help visualize patterns um, uh, so that you can make a different decision. Uh, and so, so, so that's the, I think that's the challenge. And 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 I hate to say this, but too often um, the the injustices are so awful uh, that we assume that the everyone participating in the injustices are also awful. And so, so we start uh, blocking out uh, allies um, and people who actually want to do right. And and so my whole my whole my hope, and I think part of this is sort of uh, the, the thing that we learn when we're teaching you know, give people a chance to make mistakes and give people a chance to learn. Um, okay, Susan Young has a question. Is there logic behind suing lower income households than higher income households? Seems counterintuitive if they really want to recoup funds. Uh, yes. So um, by the time the debt collectors are taking things to court, um, sometimes the paperwork they have isn't quite together um, and they're counting on the person not showing up um, uh, to contest uh, whatever whatever the plaintiff um, has said that they owe. Uh, and so who is least likely to show up? Um, people who are of minimal means um, and who have uh, little uh, uh, control over their schedules, right? And so you know, it's, it's hard to say, oh, I need to take off from work today to go to court. Um, why are you going to court? Well, uh, I'm going to court because of a debt collector. Um, that's, not, that's not a good for your reputation at work. Um, and you're not going to be paid when you, when you take off from, from work, um, especially at, at that lower um, income level. Um, and so, so, the, so I think part of the logic is if you're, it's, it's all, in some cases, it looked as if there were sort of robo signing, um, almost uh, sort of the robo signing equivalent. You, the, the plaintiffs are showing up with a big stack of cases and they're just rolling through and they say, this is what they owe plus our expenses and, and, and et cetera. And the courts are saying, okay, um, because there's no, there's no one here to, uh, to sort of contest it. Uh, and so that's the logic. So the, it's, it's a logic of power. Um, okay. Uh, one important question, I think you alluded to this and I'm gonna, um, and I, I, but it's down the list, but I think you alluded to it. Uh, Emily Tristan asks, do the debtors have any rights if the debt collectors are calling their place of employment? I think what you said is that's illegal, uh, but most people feel powerless to do anything to combat it. Yeah, so it's, it's illegal if, um, if they make it obvious that it's a debt collection call. It's not illegal to call whatever numbers you have in order to figure out where the person is if you're having trouble contacting them. And so... Um, one version of having trouble to contact someone is either they're not picking up the phone when you call or they tell you, stop calling me at home. And then you say, well, I still need to collect. I don't know where else to call you. These are the other numbers I have. And so when they do call you at work, they're only supposed to set, they're not supposed to give any indication that this is a debt call. Um, oh, I see. 
so 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 they are in so so they 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 walk a really tight line by saying I just need to talk to them because they owe us money. Um, I didn't say oh, anything well, that was outside of the bounds, right? So I protect yeah. their privacy when I did do the call. But what we're seeing is they don't protect the privacy when they do the call because that makes the that puts more pressure on the debtor. Um, uh, here's another question from Natrese Peterson. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. How can we revamp or eliminate the current credit scoring model? What other measures could we incorporate into the credit model score? Uh, metrics that focus on savings, retirement balances, job history. Is there reform on the horizon for that kind of thing? So the, so the, the credit bureaus themselves have um, pulled together some alternative uh, scoring um, models. Uh, and their, their motivation in part was there are a lot of people who are um, invisible prime, um, right? And so there's a sense that you have these consumers who are really viable but who have not participated in the market in ways that we understand. Um, and so this is some of the work that we, that we talk about in the book, um, Credit Where It's Due, with the Mission Asset Fund, where they basically said, look, there are people who are making loans and paying them back on time. Um, they're doing it with informal sector loans, um, sort of these rotating savings and credit associations that have now, that uh, that Mission Asset Fund formalized and so started uh, doing it digitally and then reporting the payments to uh, to three uh, credit agencies, and so so they were trying to find ways to take some of this alternative information and start to feed it um, into the credit bureau. So that some of that's happening um, now. One of the, the 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 pushbacks from groups like Demos is that um, because the credit score is so important. Um, and because it's so hard for consumers, if if someone sort of like there are people who say, you know, you've mixed my name up this closely, you know, my name is close to this other name. We're not the same people. This other person has a really bad credit score. It's affecting me. Um, it's really hard to get those things fixed. Um, and because yeah. it's so hard to get things fixed, and you have no real recourse because you're going to a private sector company that's that that, that doesn't have to deal with you. They say we don't have to deal with you. Um, they don't say that, but they, they act as if. Um, there, there are calls for sort of more public oversight of how these um, credit agencies are run um, and, and more public oversight and, and, and perhaps even uh, creating a public credit registry um, and, and giving consumers the right to opt out of the registry. So there are all sorts of proposals on the table right now. Okay. Um one anonymous attendee asks, is there any data on the impact of forgiving interest on all student loans as opposed to student debt or a set amount? So many still owe interest, but have, like you said, so many still owe interest, but have already paid what they originally borrowed. Um, uh, is, there, is there any push toward just forgiving all debt? Um, mm. So, uh, so we, so that I don't know, uh, and and those, and we didn't run those uh, numbers in part because we were, uh, we were trying to get a sense of um, whether or not some of the things we were seeing in the paper were true, uh, and so uh, there were some there were some things that made the rounds in uh, Washington Post and elsewhere that said you know don't don't do it because it's um, because you're going to help people who don't need it, and 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 that just didn't ring <coughs> true with some of the other things that we'd seen and done, um, and so and so we we only focused on sort of just sort of running simulations on sort of what this would mean for for yeah. folks um, based yeah, on their assets, etc. Okay, um, Sandra Escobedo asks a very interesting question. She says, "What sort of education reform at high school would you recommend?" As a low-income Latinx with little financial literacy when I started college, I was in this trap. Uh, this sounds very much like some of the stories you told. I was in this trap of proudly signing up for credit cards with no sense of the repercussions when I was unable to pay with a student income. The targeting of college students for starter credit is a huge pitfall, especially those with a limited understanding of this cycle. So is there financial literacy one needs to teach Peyton perhaps in public school? Oh, yeah. So, um... So I'll say two things on this. Um, uh, one of, <clears throat> so there's, there, there are two little wrinkles to financial literacy. Um, 
And one of the wrinkles is uh, that um, sometimes it's not what you know, but who you care about uh, that can get you into the trouble, right? And so, um, <laughs> well, well, this, this is the, and this is like this is one of those um, patterns out there. So, what we'll see with a lot of Black and Latinx households because they're low wealth, um, uh, they're more likely to have friends and family members, uh, particularly family members in their um, network. Um, who are under some kind of financial distress. And the successful ones are the ones who then help the others, right? And so everyone knows who the successful ones are, everyone knows who, who the super responsible ones are. And it becomes very difficult to sort of say, look, I need to build up some assets and savings um, uh, instead of saying, yes, I will serve um, as the informal social safety net for the family network. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. So sometimes you can give people um, some ed financial coaching. Um, and if you're not taking into account uh, what's happening in their networks, you're not really sort of giving them coaching that they can use, right? Um, the other thing that I'll say on this uh, is um, that there's, there are some people who are doing more trauma-informed coaching. Um, and so thinking about how do you give advice to someone who is under a great deal of distress? Um, a, and how do you give people an opportunity to sort of learn as they go while sort of only giving sort of just in time advice, otherwise it becomes overwhelming. Um, and so part of it is um, uh, we often, so as an educator, we think more education's better. Um, uh, but in but sort of out in the world, uh, the way that education gets delivered um, and the types of other services and products and the way they get the way they're designed can make up for a lot of the of the problems of education. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have time for a couple more questions, then we're going to have to go. Sharon Pepper asks uh, an interesting question that you haven't addressed. When parents co-sign for student loans, this places two generations of a family in a vulnerable position credit wise. Is there anyone looking at how this situation impacts and possibly depresses the ability of two generations to maintain good credit and home auto purchasing power? And, and, and I would also add to build wealth. Oh, yeah. So um, Jacob Faber at NYU and some others have, um, one of the things they've seen is uh, parents who suddenly all of this equity is getting sucked out of their homes um, as they're trying to support uh, their children. Um, it, the other thing that, that, uh, that, that we're seeing, there was a report by the JP Morgan Institute um, where they noted that, you know, there are a lot of people who have accounts that, because they looked at all their accounts of people who are paying on student loans. Uh, a lot, there are a number of people who are paying on student loans who, who themselves don't have student loans. And so they are stepping in to support um, kids and grandkids. Um, and so, so what some researchers are trying to get a handle on is the extent to which um, student loans in particular are a family affair. Um, mm -hmm. And when you have sort of uh, a lack of um, inheritance, and so, mm -hmm. you know, having a little mm -hmm. inheritance makes a huge difference. Yeah. And, and if you're Black and Latinx, you're less likely to have that. And, and right. if you do have it, it's very low. Um, that's, right. where you, that's where you start seeing the, the gaps um, opening up. Um, last question from a Amy von Bokel. We'll, 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 we won't have, we'll, this is the last question we have time for. She, she actually asks if you have examples of people who have not hidden, who have sought help and gotten creditors off their back. Um, uh, it, are there entities that can help with that in a, dig in a, in a dignified way? Uh, do debtors, uh, so for, <laughs> for example, can you reach out to legal aid and then do debtors talk to legal aid? Uh, you know, what, uh, uh, and if so, how do they find out about that kind of help? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I think there, there are a number of places that are, that are working on this. And so um, I've been in conversations with uh, uh, a couple of legal aid uh, folks. Um, I'm in conversation with uh, uh, Texas Appleseed, um, mm -hmm. yes. in conversation with the National Consumer Law Center and others. And so, and also Credit Builders Alliance. And, and so the Credit Builders Alliance, they, they had a, a really wonderful webinar not too long ago on um, debt collection with compassion um, mm. and looking at other models for, um, you know, can you stop the, the loan 
and sort of have the loan pick back up once the person is back in employment um, and just stop everything. Um, and, and you, you know, and, and what they were finding is that, you know, when people feel as if um, you're working with them, uh, they, they, they can, they're more likely to respond positively. Uh, now, the, the, the last thing I'll say on this is that we, we have to kind of think that there are two kinds of people who find themselves in the throes of debt collection. Some of them are chronic um, debtors and others are sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're new to it. They've just been thrown mm -hmm. in. Um, mm -hmm. And so the things that might work for someone who's sort of new to this problem might be very different from someone who has a whole slew of collectors calling and there's no, and it's hard for them to figure out what to focus on. Um, yeah. and, and so, and so that's a, so that's a design kind of, that's a design question. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I think we have to pay a lot more attention to how um, services uh, are being designed um, rather than only paying attention to, to, to sort of what kinds of advice we're giving people in terms of where to go to seek help or how not to get in trouble in the first place. Okay, <clears throat> Fred Weary, thank you very much for being with us today. Very informative. Uh, the, the new book that Fred has co-authored, Credit Where It's Due, is available uh, to purchase from book retailers nationwide. Uh, I don't see that. That's behind you somewhere. I don't see it. I see all oh, the other books. Oh, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's <laughs> oh, okay. Was, uh... Uh, but that book is, is new and it's available. Um, don't forget next week on June 22nd, that's, that's next, uh, next week, uh, we will share the findings from our 2021 State of Housing in Harris County and Houston report and feature a panel discussion on housing challenges, particularly for vulnerable populations. Um, also on August 11th, don't forget our next Urban Reads program with Leslie Kern discussing her book, Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. Uh, you, can, uh, you can register for the upcoming webinars by visiting kinder.rice.edu or by scanning the QR code. Again, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, and we'll see you next time. And thanks again to Fred Weary for being with us today and, and enlightening us on Houston as well as, as other places. Thanks very much.